So in this discussion, I want to talk about making the jump to robust control, to where we actually have margins for things that might happen. Um, when you talk about control, you're usually talking about having a um, sort of linear equation set. This is sort of your typical approach in a linear time invariant set. And you want to think about how do I, how do I look at control? Because um, you can make a whole set of different controllers. You can talk about doing optimal control for LQR, LQE, all sorts of things. And then at some point you go, well, what kind of stability margins do I have? And we know that there's some very famous work out there going, you might have a problem if you're not careful. And so this is where we kind of get into this. And, and interestingly enough, um, this, there's parts of this that actually came from different directions than, say, some of the other control theory. And depending on where and where you're experiencing this material, um, you know, the certain, you know, certain things get pulled together in different places. And so it's interesting that this gets used in many different, different places and different systems. But it's interesting thing when I have this system, what I can immediately say is I can build a Laplace version of this matrix system. And we're gonna call this G of S. And this is gonna be our system. And you're like, all right, so what it really means is that I've got my overall system. I've got a controller, K of S. Now that probably is a couple different things. It could be, um, it could definitely be, have some sort of an LQR controller. It could be an LQE estimator. It could be a bunch of things. It could be something you just thought up and said, this looks like a good controller. Fair enough, doesn't matter. Um, this is like, however you think it is and you think you've got a great controller, you're in good shape, right? And what's typically gonna happen is you'll have the output comes out and there'll be some feedback back to it. There may be actually additional input. In fact, almost always there's like an input in the system. You, know, you talk about a controller that keeps it to something steady. We still kind of talk about having the input there. So we wanna look at that. And what happens then is you say, well, all right, now I've got the system. I now I also, unfortunately, will have some disturbances in the system and I'll have some noise that comes on the output. Noise is a whole interesting conversation because this is usually randomness and variation in your system. Noise will typically be something that's gonna happen typically at a higher frequency. And so, you know, that's an interesting question of how you want to look at that. Disturbances are often things that happen at lower frequencies, but often, you know, in the time scale of when you want things controlled. Of course, it could also just be a disturbance like, hey, here's a whole parameter variation that just happened. Uh, it could also be a disturbance that something just changed in your environment. And that will turn out to be kind of helpful to why at least you've got, you've got some hope in these systems. Because if you look at this, I take a frequency response of this and I can actually go, okay, well, here's E of S is just this difference of things. And what I can end writing is I can say, well, you know, this Y of S, this output, I can now write and work through the entire loop here and say, well, what contributes to Y of S? Well, this GD of D of S, which is the disturbances, and there's some transformation, which is maybe part of the system, maybe not, just put it there, we'll go with that. And then what you're also then gonna get is that this is L of S, which is your overall system with the controller and the system. You'll often call that L of S by a particular name, talking about it as your loop gain, uh, because it'll be very, very important for a lot of different systems. And, but that'll just be G of S and K of S. And notice the way I've done this, I've, the order has been important because we're dealing with matrices. So your G of S is a matrix, right? It's a transformation in S, it's a matrix. K is a matrix, so you gotta be careful of that and realize the matrices are not commutative in their multiplication. So I'm being just kind of careful with how I, how I place those. And then you start to say, okay, however I put this together, uh, this is my Y of S, Y of S equals you know, go GD, there's the LS, and then I get all the stuff from the error, which is all the remaining pieces. And I put this all into one system, and you're like, yay, I now have one equation. And I can actually rearrange things. I get an I, an LS of YS, LS, all of this, and here we go. We're good, right? Um, some things come out of this that is really rather interesting once you put this together. Is you realize that y of s then is, you, I can group some terms and call it t sub s and s, which is a sensitivity and a cosensitivity term. The sensitivity is gonna be the inverse, matrix inverse, which is why it's written this way, of, of the identity matrix plus L of s. And in t of s is then going to be this matrix identity, L and L both being matrices and the identity matrix being a matrix. That's why we have a matrix inversion here. 
And so this is really quite useful. And there's a bunch of pieces that immediately come out of this. One of the very first ones is you'd really like your loop gain not to equal to minus one. Because if it does go to minus one, um, this minus, in more general, the identity matrix, so let me be careful what I mean by one here, um, I, this thing goes to zero and now things start to blow up. I don't want it to happen anywhere. And this is already an interesting issue and a way to start thinking about stability questions. Also notice that S, that your sensitivity and cosensitivity function equal to I. So they're gonna bounce, they're gonna balance off of each other. Or better yet, the sum of them will always be an identity which is basically one. So let's think about this a little bit more, say, in a scalar form for a single input, single output system. So then my y of s, um, you know, is going to be giving, you know, so g of k, 1 plus g of k, r of s, plus the additional terms that I'm going, that's going to be my input, plus a term that's going to be for the noise, plus a term for the sensitivity, right? And so, and my sensitivity is going to be 1 over 1 plus l of s. Um, I'm also then going to have my L, my T of S is then going to be one, this is basically going to be an L of S over one plus L of S. And you say, well, what does that look like in, in a real term? Well, imagine if my L of S is a nice integrator. And in fact, so many cases we wanted to be a, just a really good integrator with a single parameter where it actually hits unity, right? Because what that's going to mean is that I'm going to get in one case, a nice function that's going to basically be one here and then flat then one here and then flat, or one here and then drop off. Nice flat one here and drop off. So this is an interesting perspective because imagine if this kept just kept going, right? Well, if I had noise up here, well, that would be a problem because notice noise comes off the co-sensitivity term. So if no noise tends to be high frequency, it would just amplify up the noise. So what you want to do is keep this, you know, bounded here to a certain frequency to keep the noise under control. Well, disturbances tend to be low frequency, so I want them in this region. Well, that's good, it's kind of bounded. Now I've got one parameter to play with that kind of pushes things in between. This allows me to kind of balance them. That's great. Okay, and, and again, we run into cases like this in multiple, multiple spaces. The thing is, I get one parameter to play with this. You might go, what if LFS just, you know, had a little more second order behavior? Well, that could cause some really interesting behavior, particularly right around when gain goes to one. Get too much phase there, get too many issues, and all of a sudden, what I thought was a nice stable system, I get a lot of noise or disturbances or other things that can just move me into a place that it doesn't work well. One classic place of this is looking at like an amplifier stability for a CMOS amplifier. We see this in a lot of places, actually, um, where you know, you go, well, why do I need to make sure my amplifier stays, you know, has pretty much looks like a classic integrator all the way through? Because if I don't, I might get some very interesting stability properties. And if anything disturbs it, things that I thought were stable are no longer stable anymore. So this is kind of gives you kind of a framework where you begin with this. There's a lot more to dig into particular problems, but it's kind of important to kind of say, here's the framework of how we begin to ask these questions and how we might begin to go forward in some of these spaces.